figure is G. Luke from Altmetric. Uh, talks titles the wonderful world of Altmetrics, why researchers' voices matter. Yeah, thank you. Can everybody hear me at the back? I was sitting in the back earlier today and I was a bit... I have double mic. That, that's oh. the camera, that's the video. Okay, just, if, if anyone has any trouble hearing me, just yeah. wave. Um, so yeah, my name is Jean. I'm the Product Development Manager at Altmetric. I'm actually uh, five years out of grad school, so I have quite uh, some empathy for any PhD students in the room, any early career researchers who are sort of wondering what all of this stuff actually means and where to go outside, say, the lab or um, academia. But what I want to talk to you about is what we do at altmetric.com. And actually, it's really great that Rachel went through all the basics of what all the different signals are online, because that's basically what we track at altmetric.com. So that's where the name comes from. It's where some people get confused about the small a versus the capital A, altmetric. But basically, um, I think it's not really controversial to say that altmetrics have been experiencing a very meteoric rise in roughly the past five years. No relation to me joining, of course. Um, and Phil showed you this slide earlier, uh, and this is really the, the crux of it, right? That um, all metrics are starting to become very interesting to people because they represent a way to look outside of simply academic impact. So where we used to have very traditional bibliometrics, um, journal impact factors, citation counts, and so on, now we have so many other signals and it's a lot richer. And you know, one, one attendee here said, you know, what am I going to do with all these metrics? And I agree, it's overwhelming. But on the other hand, it does help us build a more holistic picture of what research impact is in the real world. So who is altmetric.com? You saw a little bit about um, digital science and our parent company, Holtzbrink, but we are actually a very small group, um, about 22 employees now. I joined actually just after the founding. Uh, I was a third employee, so I've seen it all change as well. And we're all based in London. so. Um, if you're ever in London and want to take a look uh, and see our offices, I do encourage you to reach out because what we really like to do is hear exactly from researchers uh, about what they think of our mission here, to track and analyze the online activity around scholarly research outputs. And since we've been going for about five years now, uh, a little over five years, we've started to see you know, that um, people are very receptive to altmetrics partially because of this near instant feedback that you get. So obviously with all these online signals, they happen so fast. Twitter is just literally just blaring all the time. We have something that we, we're tuned into something called the Twitter fire hose. And fire hose is a very good way to describe that um, amount of data. Uh, so when you publish an article now and it goes online and people mention it, you can get near instant feedback. That's what we mean. And compared to waiting months, maybe even years for citations uh, in, in sort of a traditional sense. Um, and then what I said earlier about how there are lots of different signals. What all metrics are really strong at capturing are just this variety, these flavors of attention and possibly impact, but certainly indicators of attention um, that research can have. And not just research articles, but books, data sets, software, loads of other different output types um, are possible to be tracked through all metrics. And this is a really funky infographic that I think came out earlier this week. Um, we are very obsessed with sweets at the Altmetric office, and you might have seen this from the cupcakes as well, but I really like this visual because it shows you um, this great diversity of the signals that we track. And this is certainly not the be-all and end-all of what Altmetric is tracking, uh, but it's really interesting to see just how varied they are. And actually, a lot of, um, a lot of things were discussed today. You know, there was Publons earlier and a mention of the Science Disrupt stuff. Um, Mike from uh, Faculty of a Thousand, and then we heard about Wikipedia and Reddit and so on in the Crossref talk. And we're, we're listening to all these different things. And there's a human curation element that goes into it as well with news outlets trying to get the, the most um, accurate, real news outlets possible. We're not talking about fake news here, we're just saying things that are not spam, uh, blogs as well, and also policy documents, which is an important source for all metric. But of course, uh, there are also limitations. So. What we always have to stress is that all metrics are not a replacement for peer review. They're not a replacement for reading an article. So what some people uh, may be tempted to do is almost just look at the attention and be like, I think I get what the gist of the paper is. And that's not a good way to approach it either. Um, and certainly, all metrics are not a replacement for citation-based metrics. The contrary is that uh, like we think that all metrics are complementary. So that earlier slide 
academic impact plus societal impact, we believe they're complementary. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that all metrics can be gamed. That's definitely true. If you can register for a million Twitter accounts, you can certainly start to attempt to game the Twitter side of things, and same with other uh, channels that are very easily accessible, easy to register for. But there are safeguards in place to prevent this. So um, we, we have seen actually some interesting attempts from researchers to game the system, but we have a lot of uh, checks in place. And of course, the last thing is that all metrics being so uh, nebulous, they're incredibly complex. And to get a good grasp, you have to not only look at the numbers, but also look at all the qualitative data underlying that. And that is actually where I think it is a bit of a strength of altmetrics as well, that the qualitative data are always available to you. So um, the reason why I think this crowd is really interesting is that researchers are not only uh, the ones who receive attention through altmetrics, but they're also the ones who generate that attention themselves. So they publish blogs, tweet, and so on, produce all these different signals, and then those are captured and aggregated and then used uh, to, to sort of showcase how wide-ranging the uh, impact, perhaps, was of a particular uh, research output. But what's interesting also is that not all attention is very high quality or trustworthy, and it was raised earlier as well, like, um, you know, what happens if we start to be judged by our metrics? And um, we're certainly not condoning that or even saying that it should be happening because, the, as I said, you know, the, the quality of these uh, attention, of these mentions, may not be very high. And so what I want to flip the conversation to is actually about the generation of attention and how you can actually, you have a lot of control over that. So universities are sometimes thinking about this evaluation piece. I'm going to put that to the side because what I really want to talk about are these other interesting questions. So um, a lot of research administrators have talked to me and said, how can our researchers actually influence policy? How can we learn from the data to see where our researchers are being cited and if we can make sure that they, they get heard in policy documents? Or what countries engage the most with our research and where should we you know, start sending our researchers to conferences, for example? And then just how can we leverage this attention? So it's not about evaluation, it's about understanding and using the data intelligently to do something. And I really like this quote from uh, a neuroscientist, Dr. Terry Moffat. She actually sits on our old metric advisory board. And she said, we used to envisage the college professor down the hall, but now we have altmetrics. We can see what kinds of readers are tweeting and blogging about our papers. We need to communicate with them in a different way. So I decided to do this, admittedly, on the train from London yesterday. Uh, who is talking about your particular area of research? So I picked an area that is very near and dear to my heart because I used to be a pain pharmacologist. So I chose the topic diabetic retinopathy, and I decided to focus on four different uh, attention sources. And just to see what the attention profile for this topic is, and if we can learn something about how to better target audiences perhaps interested in this topic. So this is just a, a, a random sort of gra screen grab of a bunch of different mentions I found. You know, you've got a blog from the Cochrane Library, you've got um, an NHS uh, NICE document, clinical guidelines document here. Uh, a piece in the conversation about diabetic foot disease, and a tweet from uh, a research group that works in this area. So that's the kind of spread of, I'd say, high quality attention. But then there were an equal number, or maybe way more, um, sort of more of just like blind retweeting and that kind of thing. So nothing really contributing to the conversation. So then I did a little search. We have a platform uh, at Altmetric called the Explorer, and that lets you actually dive into all the Altmetrics data in quite a lot of detail um, and look at funky, pretty charts. So this was actually the breakdown of all the attention. Um, the four sources I've highlighted here, news, there were 360 <laughs> mentions, blogs, about 148. Policy, very surprising, 245 mentions, very high uh, for this particular topic. And Twitter, as usual, uh, seems to drown everything out. But if we look at then the top influencers, potential influencers, so one thing you can do in all metric is actually export all the, all the mentions from your search. And so what I did was I pulled out all these different news outlets and I ranked, ranked them by number of mentions. You can see actually Medical Express, Medscape, and Bioportfolio are actually the ones that seem to mention this topic the most, the articles in this topic. Uh, blogs, uh, evidently Cochrane, JAMA, author interviews, and a clinical correlations one. 
policy. It was all, you know, as you might expect, medical societies. Actually, the most mentioned was the Association of Scientific Medical Societies in Germany, um, as well as the CDC and number three. And then tweeters, just sort of three random accounts that seem to talk a lot about this. And I put asterisks next to the ones that feature researchers' voices. So that's really interesting, isn't it? A lot of people are talking about this particular topic, but only three sources that I could identify were actually featured researchers weighing in in any form. And when I actually compared news and policy, it was so I, what I did was I um, checked the top 10 journals that published diabetic retinopathy papers. And then I looked at how many uh, proportionally received policy versus news attention. And some journals, as you can see, do better than others when it comes to policy mentions. And that obviously is a very desirable signal to get. Um, if you look down at PLOS, it, it receives 100% of the news uh, proportion here and zero policy mentions. But Diabetes Care is doing really well, actually. For some reason or other, policy documents reference Diabetes Care uh, in this diabetic retinopathy topic. And when you flip it to blogs, it kind of switches. So then, you know, if you're looking at specific blogs, PLOS is, is doing a bit better. Actually, Journal of American Podiatric Medical Association has zero blogs. But you can see there's a bit of a spread. Uh, tweets as well. I had to do a little bit more digging to actually find researcher voices and plot them just to see where in the world they were happening. But my point is, researchers' voices are certainly not very well represented in this set. And one thing that's come up earlier in the day is um, this idea of writing for a general <laughs> audience. Um, and I think that is useful. It, it doesn't even require that you have any published papers. You can just start writing. Um, you can raise your online profile as well. And there are lots of different ways that have been mentioned today, which I think can help. Um, I have some examples here. I'm actually going to skip through them. But you can definitely check them, look them, uh, look them up when I post the slides later. Um, just about how to become that go-to person. But really the point is that altmetrics can help you get a lay of the land for a particular research topic, right? So you want to understand who your audiences are and where they're active, which channels, for example, uh, and who are the influencers. And then the second thing is really to try and create a plan to actually promote your research in a more effective way. So don't spend the effort in going in a channel that nobody is even going to look at find the ones that actually uh, will make a difference and craft your research narrative, take it back there so that you know when I do the next search for diabetic retinopathy, there are more researchers' voices to give it a more balanced uh, flavor. So if you want to do any of this, there's a free tool called the Altmetric Bookmarklet. Um, if you go on the altmetric.com website, you can find it, or it's just altmetric.it, altmetric it. Um, some institutions may have subscriptions, and then they can do actually all that detailed analysis that I just showed you. Um, but if you have any questions, just feel free to email me. Thanks. <laughs>